Good morning, Riverwood. Good morning. As you're getting to your seats, just want to give a, a couple announcements and reminders of things coming up and, and going on. Uh, one, we have the Inner City Catfish Dinner March 30th and 31st. And if you're interested in attending one of those evenings on March 30th, uh, be sure and contact Terry. On March 31st, be sure and contact Rod uh, and let them know if you plan uh, and are able to attend the Inner City Catfish Dinner one of those evenings. You know, the last couple of weeks we haven't had our Wednesday evening fellowship meals as we've taken a break from that, but we are going to be starting that back up uh, this Wednesday night. So uh, if you plan on eating Wednesday, be sure and sign up uh, following worship this morning. And then for all of our young at heart, there's just going to be just a real quick meeting at the front of the auditorium following worship, uh, just to kind of uh, get some feedback on, on a couple plans. Uh, so it, it shouldn't take long at all, but uh, Brad will be leading that just at the beginning, uh, or at the end of worship, just at the front. So young at heart, uh, be sure and make your way to the front for that. And then next Sunday afternoon, we're going to be having our Easter egg hunt. And that is uh, going to be with four other uh, churches that we'll be working with. And that will be at East End uh, Prep, just down the street at 2 o'clock. And there is a sign-up sheet at the back of the auditorium. If you haven't been able to, uh, to sign up yet to volunteer to help out with that, uh, please be sure and do that uh, this morning. And be praying about, about this, that, that it goes well, that the community um, turns out and is able to, to see, see God's love. And, and see Christ in that activity. As far as our prayer list, just want to make a, a few notes of, of changes and, and individuals to remember. One, uh, Debbie Borum is scheduled for eye surgery on March 31st. Uh, you know, in the bulletin it says 30th is the 31st. Be praying for Debbie uh, with that. Uh, Carol Carver is scheduled uh, for hip replacement surgery on April 5th, so be praying for her as well. And then one uh, addition to the prayer list, uh, Margie Donovan, uh, that is Kathy uh, Hatcher's sister, is uh, currently on life support. And uh, so be praying just as, as they plan on, on pulling her off of that. Uh, but, but be praying for Kathy uh, and all of, all, of, all of her family. You know, as we prepare our, our minds and our hearts for worship this morning, I want to just take note of in Hebrews 3, there's this beautiful reference that it's making, that's actually making towards Psalm 95. In Hebrews 3, he says, Today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. He goes on to say, Encourage each other daily while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. I mean, how amazing is it that we have the blessing of being here this morning to worship such an amazing God. And that he is present this morning. And he longs for us to hear his voice and to listen to him. In Psalm 95, right before he says that about listening to his voice, he says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. For he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. If you'll stand with me, we're going to enter into a time of worship. But before we do that, as you stand, if you just will extend your hands like this and bow with me. Father, as we have our hands extended, a posture of receiving, Father, we pray that you will make our hearts like our hands open to you, opening up our hearts to what you have for us, of listening to your voice, that as we worship you with praise, as we hear your word, Father, just help us.
to be in tune with you, listening for your voice. Father, we pray that our hearts will not be hard to you, but truly open. Father, we long to be with you. We long to hear your voice just as you long to speak to us. And Father, we pray that you would just open up all of that. Allow your spirit to move and to work as we sing to you, as we worship you today. Let's pray. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds your hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the tree. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God is Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great. My soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. The 
splendor of a king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide it trembles at his voice it trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God and age to age he stands and time is in his hands Beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God had three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great.
searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father, it's who you are. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, love. So undeniable, I, I can hardly speak, and peace so unexplainable, I, I can hardly think as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still as you call me. Deeper still into love, love, love. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father. You may be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and all the blessings that you continually provide for us. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to be together as a church family to worship you and sing your praises. We ask today that you be with those on the prayer list. Strengthen them, help them uh, get back to uh, their normal health and be with those and guide those that are trying to treat them. We ask today that you be with the people in Mississippi that went through such a disaster. Uh, strengthen them and bring all the help that they need to somehow be able to survive what has occurred with them. Be with uh, all of our teachers here at, at Riverwood, uh, strengthen them. They are so important, as you know, to what we do. Forgive us of our sins and be with us in Christ's name. Amen. This morning's reading is taken from Galatians 1, 11 through 20. My friends, I want you to know that no one made up the message I preach. It wasn't given or taught to me by some mere human. My message came directly from Jesus Christ when he appeared to me. You know how I used to live as a Jew. I was cruel to God's church and even tried to destroy it. I was a much better Jew than anyone else my own age. Our ancestors had given to us. But even before I was born, God had chosen me by his gift of undeserved grace and had decided to show me his son, so I would announce his message to the Gentiles. I didn't talk this over with anyone. I didn't say a word, not even to the men in Jerusalem who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went once to Arabia, and afterwards I returned to Damascus. Three years later, I went to visit Peter in Jerusalem and stayed with him for 15 days. The only other apostle I saw was James, the Lord's brother. And in the presence of God, I swear I am telling the truth. Last week, we talked about Anna and uh, 
when we talked about Anna, I said we would be looking at that from three different levels, that we would start off talking about her and the event itself, and then the recording of that event, and then our reading of that particular event. And I said that that's really a, a way that you can look at almost any scripture passage, and uh, it's, a, it's a useful model that you can use. I mean, you could think as an example about Abraham. Uh, Abraham receives a promise from God. There's an event that occurs in a time and place, and then Moses records it. And when Moses records it, he has a particular spin or orientation that he wants to provide for that message because he's going to talk about that as the creation, if you will, the promise that's going to create the Jewish nation. As we read in that particular story, we encounter it as non-Jews. And so therefore, we have a different way of reading that than the initial people. Today, we're going to examine a moment, a time in the life of the Apostle Paul. And I'm not going to be using that particular methodology or style of reading it. But uh, I will tell you that on three occasions, Paul is going to talk about his conversion and what happens and what he goes through in that experience. And what we're going to observe is that there are some subtle differences as those stories unfold. And my task in my lesson for today, as I've kind of outlined it, is to look at those and then from those differences and those different stories, to kind of look back at how that can impact us. And so we're going to start not in Galatians, which Don read for us this morning, but we're going to start in Acts chapter 9. So if you've got your Bible with you or you've got your device, please turn over to that. Now, just as a quick reminder of background, according to Acts chapter 8, the apostle, at that time he's not an apostle Paul, but Saul, he is, uh, he's persecuting the church. He's there as an individual who sees and witnesses the first Christian martyr, the death of Stephen. And he then, according to chapter 9, is invigorated by that and launches a campaign to persecute Christians. And as that kind of unfolds and develops, he sets off on a mission to try to go to Damascus and bring those individuals back to the city of Jerusalem where they can be prosecuted. Now, before we uh, kind of get into that story, though, uh, uh, a little bit of background here. We're going to talk about Petra. How many of you have been to Petra? Let me see some hands. Uh-huh. See, I knew we had some, some ringers in the audience. Okay. So how many of you have seen Petra in a movie or... Say, yeah, see, everybody raise your hand. Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, you know, one of the, not Lost Ark, Search for the Holy Grail. Got to get my sequels here correct, okay? So anyway, though, I mean, we're familiar with this, all right? We're, we're familiar with this story, all right? This is, Petra was the capital of uh, the Nabataean group, uh, their kingdom, okay? And they were traders on the east side of the Jordan. And they had great influence that went from the Sinai and Arabian peninsulas all the way up to the city of Damascus. And so that helps us understand when Saul is going to Damascus, he's going into an area that is outside the control, really, of the Roman Empire and definitely the Jewish leadership. And I'm guessing that when that persecution kind of launched itself in Acts chapter 8, that there were Christians in Jerusalem and that area that thought, aha, I'm going to escape from being having to be persecuted and prosecuted. I'm going to run to Damascus because there's some safety there. And yet what we find is that Saul obtained some letters from the Jewish authorities that would give him an intervention there, maybe saying that this is a religious matter, not a civil one. And so as Saul nears that particular city, there is an appearance that God brings to him of Jesus Christ. 
and, and he's told that he's going to go into the city of Damascus and wait there for instructions. He receives instructions from Ananias, and, and he tells him what he needs to do, and he is converted, and he follows that particular instruction. Now, after his conversion, what Luke tells us in verse 20 is that at once he begins to preach. And he has a measure of success, so much so that after many days there are individuals who are upset about that and there is this plot to kill and put him to death, but they find out about that plot and so he escapes over the wall in a basket and is then able in the next stop to go to the city of Jerusalem. That's verse 25, or excuse me, 26. That's the first telling of the conversion in Acts of the Apostle. In chapter 26, or excuse me, chapter 22, Paul is arrested. And he is taken up to what is known as the castle of Antonio. And it's kind of a barracks area where there were some troops, Roman troops that were killed. And as Paul is making his way up those steps, he asked for permission to talk to the crowd of individuals who were there. And he recounts some of these events that we have just went over. And he talks about this, but he doesn't mention his preaching in the city of Damascus. Instead, the focus that he has here is upon what is happening in the city of Jerusalem. And he's talking about the fact that he comes back to Jerusalem, he goes back into the temple area, and there he encounters Jesus in a trance. He has a vision, and he talks about that in much more detail. And the vision tells him uh, that he needs to receive the instruction of the Gentiles. Now, the details of this experience aren't given in chapter 9 but they match up perfectly, they match up perfectly to this moment in time, meaning what's happening in the city of Jerusalem. Now, in Acts chapter 26, there is a third telling of this particular event. And the apostle is now before King Agrippa, and he is, he is there talking about you know, what's going on and the circumstances and the situation. He's been in prison over in Caesarea. And again, he doesn't mention anything about his preaching in the city of Damascus, but he does provide now more details about his persecutions of Christians and his encounter with Jesus on the road. So there are these three references in the book of Acts to this conversion story. And they have their differences, but I think this is critical to understand. Those differences demonstrate the reliability of the story rather than it's fabricated. They demonstrate the reliability rather than the fact that it's just made up. Because generally, when a person makes up a story and they report it over and over again, they're trying to remember it exactly the way that they created that particular story. When you have a story that is subtly changed in difference depending upon the audience and the purpose, that is showing to us that it's factual information. And so in Luke chapter 9, where, or excuse me, Acts chapter 9, where Luke is telling this, he's talking, his purpose is to reveal what's happening in the early church. When Paul in Acts chapter 22 is saying this, he's not telling a story, he's giving his testimony. And his, his testimony emphasizes the Jewishness, the Jewishness that he has and his faithfulness to the law. And he yearns for his Jewish accusers to become Christians and followers of Jesus just as he has. And, and he identifies himself with them. He talks about how he's, he's discussing the God of our Father. And then in chapter 26, that's a very small, really non-hostile audience as Paul reports and discusses that. It's different. 
So it is the same story that Paul is reporting here. It's given in different settings with slight differences. Now, as we have looked at those three stories, we need to add in the one that Don read for us today from Galatians, the one that's on the front of your bulletin. Because here, Paul is writing to the churches of Galatia. And as he does so, he has a very clear, very stated purpose in mind. And that is that the content of the gospel that he is proclaiming and preaching is exactly the same as that of Peter and James and the other apostles, okay? And the reason it is the same is that it has the same source, and that is Jesus Christ. And if anyone deviates from that core concept, that gospel that's given, whether it's from the apostles or it's from Paul, that is apostasy. Now, in Galatians... Paul details his conversion. But again, there is a different emphasis than what we saw in the book of Acts. The emphasis there is that his gospel, even though it is distinct, parallels that of Peter and James and the others. And Paul says in verse 16 that God revealed Jesus to him. And he does, he does not immediately return to Jerusalem to consult with those other apostles, uh, apostles to be taught by them, but instead he makes a trip into the Arabian desert. And then he returns to Damascus some three years after his conversion, and only then does he head back to Jerusalem and meet with Peter and James. Now, all of that is new information for us. It does not negate in any way what was stated in the book of Acts, nor does it contradict what was said in that story. Instead, it expands it and fills in information that previously we didn't know we didn't know. And Acts is not giving us a timeline. It doesn't say, now, this is exactly the way things were. It doesn't claim to be complete. In Galatians, though, we learned that there's this three-year lapse between Saul leaving Jerusalem to persecute the Jews up in Damascus and is finally getting back to Jerusalem where he is considered a troubling figure. So what happens during that three-year interim that is described here? Well, we can start with verse 12, where he talks about the fact that he is being taught by Jesus. And verse 16 adds that his immediate response was not to consult with any human being. And many individuals contend that he is in the wilderness for three years being taught and being ministered to and given insights by Jesus. And that three-year period is parallel to what we read about in the Gospels, where Jesus is with the other apostles for three years. Just as in the Gospels, Jesus interacted with those disciples, he's for three years now in the desert interacting with Paul. And there are, in their experience teaching sessions and other activities, preaching that goes on. There is the limited commission. Verse 16 adds that uh, it was revealed to him uh, that during his ministry he would preach to the Gentiles. Now, that's interesting because if you go to Acts chapter 9, when he is teaching and preaching in Damascus, he's doing so to basically a Jewish audience. And so that raises the question, Does he wait a significant period of time before he begins preaching to the Gentiles? Many individuals would therefore submit, no, that what he does is he goes into Arabia, this area of uh, of King Eretus and the Nambatans and, and that kingdom, and that's where he is preaching and teaching along the way to a Gentile audience. And so if we bring all that together, he's a tent maker, he's supporting himself, he is being given instruction by Jesus, and he's preaching. And he has these regular interactions with this vision of Jesus that provides new insight 
and direction about the scripture passages and how he examined them while he was a Pharisee. Now, by the way, in Galatians chapter 2, he reflects upon a meeting that occurs some 14 years later when he goes back to the city of Jerusalem, and when he does, he meets with Peter and James, and they kind of sit down and compare notes, and what he finds out and says at that time is, they added nothing to my message. How is that the, the, the case? Well, they're preaching the same salvation, they're talking about the same Christ, and the, the only answer for that is that they had been taught by the same person, that the source is Jesus as well. Now, very quickly, there's a, a final reference to this period in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he has been labeled as an inferior apostle. And in his defense, he begins to talk about some painful experiences that he has. And in verse 32, he references his escape from Damascus in that basket over the wall. But even there in 2 Corinthians, there are some new details that are given to us. Okay, uh, and, and he says in Acts chapter 9, or we're told uh, that he was under attack by the Jews. Well, we're told that this Nabatean king, Artus, has been after him as well, okay? And, and Artus was kind of the high water mark, if you will, of that kingdom. He reigned from 9 B.C. to 39 A.D., okay? And by the way, that reference that Paul makes gives us a couple of insights. Number one, it kind of gives us an idea when was the latest that Saul could have been converted. And we have to back it up three years. We know that uh, Eretus was uh, out and died in 39, so probably Paul was converted 34, 35 A.D. And secondly, it tells us that there was Gentile resistance to his ministry there in Damascus. And so I just kind of have to assume then uh, that as Paul had some Gentiles who were stirred up and and upset by his preaching at Ephesus, we know that from the book of Acts, it's very likely that in this three-year period that he's over there in this other area uh, that there are some folks who are upset as well. A, a quick final note, in the next chapter of 2 Corinthians, Paul mentions that, uh, that there was a time in his life when he was caught up into the third heaven, and it would be really nice if we could tie that back to that vision that he had in the temple, or if we could, you know, say that happened to him while he was out in the desert, that you, you just can't get the chronology to work to do that, okay? So we've gone through all of these passages now, five references in the scriptures that talk about Paul's conversion, okay? Now, if we kind of step back away from that, what do we learn? What do we learn? Well, the first thing I think that we learned is the basic truthfulness of his message. You know, again, the slight differences that we see here in what Paul reports, it doesn't diminish the veracity of his story. Instead, on the other hand, it enhances it. And it demonstrates the core authenticity of what he is saying. Saul is a huge opponent of Christianity, no question about that. And, and, and he sought ways to extinguish the flame of faith among Christians. Obviously, something dramatic happens to him on that road to Damascus that literally totally changes the direction of his life. And over a period of three years, that whole process alters him. He has new values and new goals. Really, everything changes. And that is a strong proof for what the New Testament says, for the story of Jesus and for its historicity. Okay, I mean, yeah, the other apostles are changed. How do you explain the fact that these guys in the Gospels are just kind of fumbling, bumbling along 
they get things wrong right occasionally. They're, they're all run off by the time of the crucifixion of Jesus, you know, all but really I guess John is, is a witness there. And how do you explain their sudden change without some miraculous event? Well, the same thing can be said about the Apostle Paul. I mean, this guy Saul is trying to kill Christians, okay? That's his purpose and aim. And, and so now we have him in a completely different direction. In Galatians, Paul's point is that he didn't meet with the apostles right away, okay? Luke's point is to talk about the history and development of the early church. Those are minor differences in directions, but it, the story is the same. And that's our first takeaway here, and that is that the Bible is shown to be a reliable record. Secondly, I, I would observe that Christ's likeness is a process. It, it's not a moment. There is growth in the life of Paul, and it's driven by this lifelong desire to become the person that God intends him to be. And we see that in his life. I mean, he heads from Jerusalem to Damascus, and he is absolutely convinced that he is doing the work of God. But he encounters Jesus, and it requires him to rethink and reprocess all the way that he has read the Scriptures before. And that takes time, initially at least three years. But really, it's time that we see all the way through his life. There's a overlooked passage toward the close of his ministry in 2 Timothy chapter 4, which is now 20 years later in this chronology. Paul is in jail for the second time. He's most likely not going to be released. He's in his mid to late 60s, maybe even early 70s, and he requests that his young protege join him. And he asks in verse 13, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially my parchments. Paul may be toward the end of his life, but he's still a student. He's still studying. He's still reading. He's still thinking. He's not finished. We see that in the life of Peter. I, I mean, Peter is an incredible person, you know, but Early on, he's bold and he's brash. Yeah, he does things, but sometimes he gets caught in between them. He's, he's sometimes wrong and short-sighted. He'll be an amazing speaker in Acts chapter 2 and, and a huge figure in the early era of the church in the book of Acts. But, but even then, although he's further along, he has his struggles. So in Acts chapter 10, when he's told to kill and eat the things that he sees, he pushes back and is hesitant. And 14 years later in Galatians chapter 2, he'll be confronted by Paul over his behavior with the Gentiles. What am I saying? I'm saying that there's a lifetime of growth and development in the life of Peter. Now by application, I would submit to you that that mentality needs to manifest itself in each and every single one of us. Our growth our development must continue. There is no retirement plan in the Christian walk. We are to continuously be growing and moving. My grandmother passed just shortly before her 104th birthday. And I know what she was doing a week before her death. She was reading the Bible, studying God's Word, and praying and communicating with Him. She was constantly in an ongoing relationship with him. Don't stop short, friends. Hunger for God, always. The Bible is reliable. Christ-likeness is a process. Number three, we must make sure that we obey God. In Acts chapter 26, Paul is giving the last recorded time when, when he's talking about what's going on in his conversion. And, and he says to Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. He obeys that vision. God had a plan for Saul uh, that he began to implement. 
uh, but he must be active in finding what God wanted him to do. And the same is true of each and every single one of us. This year, we have developed a theme, and that theme is its time. And there are three trimester emphases that are part of that theme. It's time to hunger. It's time to unify. It's time to move. And since January, we have been focused on the first of those, and I have been kind of unpacking, if you will, some stories of characters. We've been talking about characters who had an interaction, if you will, with, with God. And, and many of those we find in the desert, we find in the wilderness. And as I kind of step away from that, I, I find it interesting that each has some subtle differences. For an example, for many of those characters, uh, they come in contact with God as part of a desired journey. And there's no question that I would put Anna from last week and Simeon before that into that category. That, that was David, okay? I, I mean, he is walking with God in the wilderness. Uh, uh, Elijah would be there. But for some, they encounter God, and it's almost like an accident, okay? Hagar did not intend to find God, but she did in the desert. And I don't think Daniel anticipated the fact that he would be in Babylonian and then later under the Persian captivity all of his life. But he was there, and, and he utilized that to draw closer to God. And, and then at the same time, we find individuals who, quite frankly, are like, uh, like Moses, okay, who kind of settle in, if you will, to their life, okay? And, and, and there's this burning bush that surprises him. I don't know what your personal walk or pathway with God is. I don't know how your journey has unfolded. But I do know that we must, we absolutely must embrace the plan that God has for us. Yes, there is a personal part of that, okay, where we come to faith and we're convicted of our failings and, and we are baptized, and we receive the Holy Spirit in forgiveness. But there's more that God wants to do in us and through us. God wants us to impact the world around us. And, and, and that's critically important, uh, that yes, we have that personal experience and are baptized and, and, and walk with Him, but we must continue to grow as He develops us. That one moment is to serve as a launching point that dramatically takes us further along. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Dear God, we're thankful for what you did in the life of Saul. And we're thankful, God, that you moved in his life and you directed him and you guided him and that you brought him to be the person and model that he became. And we pray, Father, that as we follow in his footsteps, that we too would have that experience of conversion, that we too would come to know you, and then that that would manifest itself in our life, in a life of service, in a life that continues as we grow closer and closer to you. Help us, God, to hunger after you with a renewed passion. We ask all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Grace, 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 grace.
produce greater than all our sin. Dark is the state that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Why do that so you may be today? Marvelous grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, Freely bestowed on all who believe, you that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Pierce my ear, O Lord my God, take me to your door today. I serve no other God. Lord, I'm here to stay, for you have paid the price for me. With your blood you ransomed me. I will serve you eternally. A free man I'll never be. So pierce my ear, O Lord my God. Take me to your door today. I will serve no other God. Lord, I'm here to stay. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Into the river I will wade. There my sins are washed away from the heaven's mercy streams of the Savior's love for me. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. I will rise from waters deep into the saving arms of God. I will sing salvation songs. Jesus Christ has set me free. 
Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. Christ, we do all adore thee, and we do praise thee forever. Christ, we do all adore thee, and we do praise thee For on the holy cross hast thou the world from sin redeemed. Christ, we do all adore thee. And we do praise thee forever. Christ, we do all adore thee. Please be seated. This morning, as we uh, as we prepare for communion, I want to uh, just share you a, a uh, an article on uh, how we should uh, approach communion. It says that communion is much more than just a small piece of bread and a little cup of juice at the end of service. It's a powerful sign and seal of God's love shown in the person and work of Jesus. May we be, be, be prepared to celebrate this truth this week by searching our hearts, asking for forgiveness, forgiving others, seeking unity with fellow Christians, and asking Jesus to nourish us in this holy moment. Let's go to, let's go to Christ in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful today for the opportunity to be together and as we prepare for communion please help us to give you all of our attention we pray that you are pleased with with our actions this morning and we're thankful that that you are with us it's hard for us to understand how you could offer your life for sinners Help us to show our appreciation every day. Father, we ask you to bless the bread that to us represents his broken body. We ask you to bless the juice that we're about to partake of, which to us represents his precious blood that he gave for us. We ask this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen.
There's this real beautiful prayer that Paul gives in Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 14. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is his love, his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. You know, we don't typically when we're praying for each other necessarily, at least if your prayers are probably like mine, not like that, not with so much just there of, you know, we'll pray for healing, we'll pray for for different things, which are all good, all things we should be praying for for each other, but to pray for us to be strengthened in this way is such a beautiful thing. So what I'd like for you to do this morning, just for a second, I want you to just look around the room. You'll see a face that that may just strike in your mind or in your heart. And I just want you to think about that individual in here. Or maybe it's someone else who comes to mind within this body. But as I read this, I want you to be praying with this person, this individual in mind. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower them with inner strength throughout his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in their hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand as all God's people should. How wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. You know, prayer is such a powerful thing. And more than that is the powerful God who listens, who hears our prayers. And so this week, I want to encourage you to be praying through this passage in Ephesians, not only for each other, but for the community around us. I love what it says, now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Let us pray with boldness. The God who loves and is gracious and hears our cries. Let us pray that he acts within this community, within this congregation, to move and to transform us in ways that we can't even imagine. 
things he has at work. And may we glorify him with our lives. Let's pray. Father, you are so amazing. The beautiful words that that Paul wrote here just of a prayer for strengthening. So beautiful. What is so amazing is that within each of our lives, you are present. That even when I feel like you are so distant, the truth is you are right there. And I'm the one who's keeping you distant. Father, may each of us within this congregation truly live into the life that you've given us through your Son. May you move in ways that we could not even imagine. Hope for. May you transform us just as we breathe right now. This very breath that we have is a gift from you. Without you, we have no life, we have no breath. So, Father, we want to give our lives to you fearing and in awe of who you are and the mighty work that you have done and continue to do throughout each of our lives. All glory to you forever and ever. Amen. As you're dismissed this morning, just do not forget to sign up at the back of the auditorium for Easter and also young at heart, come to the front and Just be sure and and pass your cards to the aisle and the kids will pick it up on your way out. Thank you very much for joining us for worship this morning.